I'm sorry, everyone. I didn't press record earlier. Um, but anyway, both of these dogs have, you know, are panting, as you can see in this photo. Uh, and they are probably experiencing some mild heat stress. Um, <clears throat> and they probably do have an elevated body temperature. But both dogs don't appear to be stressed. They actually look happy that the person is coming, uh, the, the one that's taking the picture of them. Um, so these dogs are probably not too stressed. <clears throat> and other studies done, <clears throat> the body temperature and degree of exhaustion depends upon the breed of dog, such as greyhounds. Uh, while they're racing, their body temperature can reach upwards of 106, which is considered heat stroke. Uh, Labrador retrievers, while hunting, can reach body temperatures elevated as high as 107. And then sled dogs, known as the endurance athletes of the canine world, can reach upwards body temperatures upwards of 108 and still not be experiencing heat stroke. Uh, but at the same time, all of these dogs are in really good physical condition. They've been trained physically to do these things and they're conditioned for those temperatures and that kind of physical work. Uh, these dogs are with sheep above the Vail Valley in Colorado. Um, even though the temperature may be a high in the 80s, the air is very dry, but the radiation from the sun is increased due to the, the increased altitude. Notice there are no shade trees. This terrain is actually very similar to what you would see in Turkey. Um, this is a long-coated Akbash dog here in the front, and this is a medium-coated Akbash dog here in the back. I don't know if y'all can see all the sheep scattered throughout the sage. It's actually a pretty nice yeah. picture. <clears throat> <laughs> um, they really blend into the sage and the dead grass, but Laura and uh, Brian, this dog here in the front, that's probably Sam. Uh, <laughs> And Sam is at Laura and Brian's house uh, right now. <laughs> okay, hyperthermia um, is divided into two categories. There's pyrogenic, which results from a fever uh, due to infection, whether it's viral or bacterial. Uh, and then there is non-pyrogenic, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. Non-pyrogenic is heat-induced thermal stress, which includes heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Now, <laughs> non-pyrogenic is divided into two groups. <laughs> Again, there is non-exertional, which specifically the dog is not exerting itself. It happens when they're in a confined space, <clears throat> like a small pen or even your backyard. A dog can suffer from heat stroke just in your backyard. Um, if you do have your puppy in a bonding pen, make sure that your bonding pens are well shaded and they have plenty of water for them to drink and a tr trough or pool for them to soak in. Of course, a dog in a vehicle out in the heat is going to get suffer from non-exertional hyperthermia. Um, <clears throat> and all of this is some type of environmental heat energy injury. Just being in the heat and not having to exert themselves, they can still get hurt. And then there's exertional hyperthermia, which is exercise induced. Not only is it hot, but exercise is inducing the hyperthermia. Of course, it's then made worse by the environment that the dogs are in. <clears throat> and it also depends upon the physical fitness of the dog. And in a lot of the stuff I've read about heat stroke, physical fitness of your dog plays a very important part. The more physically fit your dog is, the better able they are to tolerate heat and like they have, like here, exertional hyperthermia. They can tolerate the physical exertion um, <clears throat> that creates heat in a, in a dog.
there are certain conditions that increase the risk of hyperthermia. <clears throat> and even though you might live um, in a physical location like the Northern United States or New England uh, that are normally cool in the summer, they don't necessarily experience the high temperatures that we do here in Texas. Um, dogs actually in this location are more likely to experience heat stress when an unexpected heat wave arrives along with high humidity, which comes along with a rapid change in temperature, an abnormal high temperature, <clears throat> and high humidity. Because dogs, through their panting, they're trying to reduce their body temperature, high humidity makes it a lot more difficult. And, um, <clears throat> but the thing is, for a lot of people, that unexpected high temperature and high humidity, actually, those dogs are the most likely to suffer from heat stress. <clears throat> Lots of water is vital for our dogs, especially because they are out working at all hours of the day. They could be up and moving around and uh, watching their livestock, chasing off, you know, birds of prey or what have you. <clears throat> so they need lots of water. <clears throat> Air circulation is really important, especially if your dog is in a small space, a yard or a barn, uh, a bonding pen, um, because if there's no breeze whatsoever, dogs, it will increase the risk of hyperthermia. Um, I can't stress enough how important water is uh, to cooling off our working dogs and reducing the risk of heat stress. Pool, you know, little swimming pools, water troughs, whatever it takes. Um, you know, whether it's a water trough like these girls are enjoying or a pond like this, this is a good way for dogs to cool off. And these are a couple of pups of mine from last summer. Uh, they're in a relatively small pasture with just a few head of livestock. They didn't necessarily go very far during the day, maybe a half mile away from the house. But this tank, this pond was actually kind of halfway in between the house and kind of the distance that the goats would travel during the day. So the pups always enjoyed cooling off here. Factors that contribute to heat production. <clears throat> First of all, it is the exposure to excessive temperatures, uh, and especially those that are, as I said, unusual, abnormally high, and which the dog is not acclimated to. Exercise incre increases heat production in the body. Muscle metabolism accounts for 80% of the body's overall heat production during exercise. <clears throat> fatigue, <clears throat> uh, a canine that's not moving as efficiently, uh, and this goes back to conformation, which we've discussed about in, in different programs, and we've had articles in the bulletin and so forth, um, but anyway, proper conformation, which allows a dog to move efficiently and easily cover some ground without being fatigued, will, you know, in decrease their likelihood of, you know, getting heat stroke. <clears throat> Anxiety. Um, a lot of times, and I don't know if any of y'all have had, seen dogs that were very, very anxious, but one of the first things that a really anxious dog starts exhibiting is the hyperventilation. Once a dog starts hyperventilating, they're actually increasing the heat in their body. And um, if the dog is already stressed by, and it's already hyperventilating, and then it's exposed to higher heat, it just makes the whole situation worse for a dog to be, you know, anxious while it's hot. <clears throat> Certain drugs do cause a rise in body temperature. Um, you might want to, if your dog is taking certain medicines, you might want to double check with your vet 
uh, whether or not those medicines uh, in, will increase your dog's uh, body temperature. Certain health conditions can kind of uh, cause the dog to uh, not be able to tolerate very much heat. <clears throat> Some of those things are just the most basic anatomy uh, of a dog. Um, obesity, um, they just can't shed as much, they can't dissipate heat as well when they're, when they're obese. The very young and the very old are uh, very susceptible to heat and uh, disease in general um, can cause dogs to be more susceptible to the heat. Looking at anatomy, this is a picture of a long-coated Akbash dog over here on the left. His name was Nelson. Um, he's at my dad's house in this photo. Nelson actually wound up here at my house uh, later and spent his last years here with me. He was a really nice dog. And here over here to the right, we have just a stock photo of a great Pyrenees and you can see that Nelson has a little bit longer hair you know than some of the of the medium coated dogs that many of you are familiar with but <clears throat> it's not just the fact that this great Pyrenees has a long thick coat of hair look how short he is to the ground compared to this Akbash this this anatomy of a tall longer legged dog this dog, this Akbash dog can dissipate heat better than this dog right here. This dog is closer to the ground. It's receiving the radiation of heat from the ground. So, I mean, when people ask, you might ask you, you know, well, what's the difference between an Akbash and a Great Pyrenees? What makes one better than the other? Well, one of them might be just that it's not just that they've got short, you know, this big thick coat is that they're shorter to the ground. They're just going to be more susceptible to the heat than the Akbash dog. Um, years ago, we did have Great Pyrenees. Uh, that was the first guard dog we ever had out at my dad's. And we always felt so sorry for them during the summer because they were miserably hot. It was just, the Akbash dogs have always been much more tolerant to the heat than the Great Pyrenees were. <clears throat> An obese dog just cannot dissipate heat as fast as a um, thinner, more athletic dog. In the picture on the left, this dog, you can see she's pretty well rounded over the rump here, and she's pretty thick through this hind quarter, and you can't really see her muscling at all, and it's because she has a pretty thick layer of fat. And she's got a thick neck here where she's got uh, fat built up. And if, if an animal, any animal, <laughs> is fat here on the outside, they've also got increased fat on the inside of their body, which again, that's, that's, they're just not able to dissipate heat when they've got fat around their organs and everything else. <clears throat> We need to make sure that our dogs are physically fit to do the job they were meant to do and withstand temperature changes. Keep in mind our breed standard, which says that the Akbash dog should have the appearance of a sight hound. <clears throat> this dog over here, where as you can see some ribs and the dog, you know, appears to be thin. The dog if you look at its hindquarters here, you can see the muscling in these hindquarters. And even in the forequarters, you can see the, how well muscled this dog is. And look across the loin here. Look how well rounded it is. That's muscling, that's not fat. You can see the hip bones just slightly, but that's okay. Um, it's supposed to have the appearance of a side, side hound. This is a very healthy dog. This dog uh, can dissipate heat a lot faster than the dog on the left. Now, a variety of diseases can cause obesity in a dog, not just overfeeding. So if you know you're not overfeeding your dog, you might want to check with your vet uh, and see if there's a disease issue. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Puppies cannot regulate their body temperature. Puppies can easily become dehydrated or overheated. Plan breeding so that your pups and dam are not stressed by the heat, even unexpected heat in normally cooler climates. Uh, and if nothing else, just be prepared, you know, to run fans, misting system, or something like that, uh, if you do happen to have pups in the heat. I did have a litter of pups born on July 5th, and thankfully we have had cooler than normal temperatures here for our area in Texas. Uh, but at the same time, the dam and the pups have been pretty well miserable. Um, there for a while, I mean, the dam just, she just really didn't want to spend a lot of time with the pups and the pups, they were getting, they were getting hungry. I was having to supplement them. Um, and it's not that she wasn't making milk. It's just, she wouldn't stay with them for very long periods just because of it was so hot. Um, hopefully I never have, I, hopefully I never go through this again. I mean, it, it's been pretty bad. And I was going out there three and four times a day and dipping the puppies in water uh, or rubbing them with wet cloths in order to help cool them off. It was just, it was a lot more work trying to help them maintain a better body temperature in this heat. And because the dam may not want to lay with the puppies and let them nurse as often, the puppies may not grow or thrive compared to pups born in cooler months of the year. So it's something to consider when you are planting a litter is when are the puppies going to be born and what is the normal temperatures and how are you going to manage that? <clears throat> Uh, some of you have probably heard me and others talk about bonding pens for puppies. And one of the reasons we've stated is to keep pups in a safe location. Um, a young pup, um, like this one here, following older dogs miles from water in the heat is in serious jeopardy of heat stress or heat stroke. They still cannot regulate their body temperature like an older dog and can suffer heat exhaustion before they reach the next water. <clears throat> this photo was taken at my uh, dad's house. Again, I, I think that's Nelson. Uh, that might be Tommy um, on the other side. I'm not sure who the puppy is. Maybe Delam. Um, but anyway, at my dad's house, for instance, it's several hundred acres, and most of it is in just one big pasture. And so water, you know, whether it's a pond or a water trough, they can be a long distance apart from one another at my dad's. And same way at my house. Um, if I, I have a young pup in a bonding pen right now, and if I were to turn him out with some older dogs and let him go with them, he might actually get into a position where he's far enough from water that he winds up suffering from heat exhaustion before he gets back to a safe, to water to cool off. <clears throat> uh, if your dog is very old, uh, older dogs are not able to regulate their body temperature either, just like the, the puppies. This is, pro this is one of our dogs, uh, Missy. Um, she was a matador dog. Uh, she was at my dad's house for a long time, but she wound up here at my house for several years before she passed away. <clears throat> uh, your older dog is probably going to look for shade, uh, for a shade tree or water before your young dog does, which is fine. Um, you might consider providing your older dog with smaller pastures to limit travel during hot months, uh, make sure making sure they have uh, plenty of shade, water, and cool surfaces to lay on to make their life easier and extend their working years. There's a variety of diseases um, that can cause our dogs to be predisposed to heat stress. You know, in my experience, um, most of the Akbosh dogs have been really healthy dogs. Um, <clears throat> um, 
But anyway, but di diseases in general can cause a dog to become easily dehydrated. Uh, <clears throat> most of the time, in what I've been studying or whatever, it is the fact that the diseases have gone undiagnosed in the dogs and you, you're not aware of the disease in your dogs and um, they get overheated uh, easily. <clears throat> High temperatures, of course, just add to the problem of dehydration that diseases in general can cause. Uh, Cardio, any kind of cardiovascular disease can predispose your dog to heat stress, but at the same time, I've really never known uh, or heard of an aquash dog having any kind of cardiovascular diseases. Laryngeal um, paralysis. Um, I've never known aquash dogs to have it. It is fairly common in the Great Pyrenees as well as other breeds of dogs. Um, this causes a shortness of breath, noisy breathing, cough, and an intolerance to exercise because they just can't get enough air. Um, <clears throat> hyperthyroidism, um, and actually various thyroid conditions can cause a dog to be less tolerant of heat. And from what I'm hearing, you know, the thyroid regulates mel metabolic actions in the body and in some cases, they call it, you know, the thyroid acts as like a thermometer kind of. It helps regulate heat in the dog. And if it's not working correctly, um, it can predispose them to heat stress. Diabetes causes extreme thirst in most dogs. And if it's already hot, you know, they just seem like they can't get enough water. Again, I've never known an Akbosh dog to have diabetes, but at the same time, it's something you need to keep in mind. So how do dogs dissipate heat? The first way is respiration through panting, as you see in this photo uh, with this dog. <clears throat> Panting accounts for 60% of heat dissipation. Dogs sweat through their pads. They don't sweat like you and I, and, uh, but they do sweat through their pads. They also experience heat loss through their skin, which has minimal hair, which is on the belly, the insides of their back legs and front legs. And um, that's why I think it's real important if you have water for your dogs, it is, it's important for them to have a trough or pool or something that they can not just drink out of, but they can get in, they can get their feet wet and maybe lay down and get their belly wet. It doesn't have, they don't have to completely submerge in the water, but getting their feet and bellies wet, I think really does help them to cool off more quickly. Uh, dogs' behavioral response to um, being hot, they will seek cool surfaces of any kind, whether it's a concrete floor in your barn, you know, some cool dirt near a water trough or such as that. Uh, they'll, of course, be seeking shade of some sort or another. Uh, hopefully, there's water around for them to get into and get a drink. Uh, they will more likely hang out where they can, you know, they're getting a breeze uh, to help cool them off. And uh, they will also be avoiding activity. And probably for our dogs, um, you need to be concerned if the dog just doesn't want to be with their livestock. They're, so, they're hot enough that they just don't want to be with them. Preferring water and shade over their livestock could be an early warning sign of heat exhaustion. <clears throat> the early stages of heat exhaustion, um, keep in mind, once you see these symptoms, heat stress has already occurred. Um, uh, the dog will, of course, have a rapid pulse. There will be hyperventilation. Their mouth will be open really, really wide. They'll, their tongue is probably gonna be extended 
about as long as it can outside their mouth. <clears throat> they will have dry mucous membranes. You'll be able to put your finger on their gums or on the inside of their lips and it will feel dry even though they are experiencing hypersalivation. <clears throat> They'll be in somewhat of a depressed state or in a kind of stupor. And this is again, this behavior at this time would be a reluctance to work and they probably are not listening to you. They are in that stupor. Um, <clears throat> You'll, they'll also be experiencing vomiting and diarrhea. <clears throat> and part of what makes heat stress and heat exhaustion and heat stroke so serious for a dog is that, and so deadly, um, is that it affects all of the vital organs in the body. It's not affecting just one. All of them are affected. Uh, it's the cardiovascular system, it's the pulmonary system, the renal system, the gastrointestinal system, it's everything is affected at the same time, which makes it more deadly than a lot of other uh, problems a dog might have. Okay, um, so on severe heat stroke, if you'll, if can note, remember here, on the early stages, the dog had a rapid pulse. With severe heat stroke, the dog will have a weak pulse. And uh, instead of having the dry mucous membranes of the early stages will go to pale mucous membranes. <clears throat> and instead of having hyperventilation, the dog will start experiencing shallow respiration. You'll continue to have the vomiting and diarrhea and most of it will be just completely uncontrolled. Um, and there is the high possibility of the dog having a seizure while they're uh, experiencing a heat stroke. The mortality rate for heat stroke is approximately 50%. Uh, most of the dogs that live over heat stroke were treated immediately by their owners uh, as far as cooling, they're trying to cool their body down. And then they also received emergency vet care in less than 90 minutes. And the thing is, again, it's every system in the body is affected by heat stroke. Everything is wanting to shut down at the same time. So what do we do? First and foremost, you need to wet the dog down any way you can get him wet, in a water trough, uh, in your bathtub, water, you know, garden hose on the back porch or in the barn. Uh, most uh, people suggest cool water, uh, but in this paper that I've been reading in, um, they actually suggest ice water. Um, and according to them, to date, there have been no scientific studies to prove one way or the other that ice water is bad for cooling the dogs down uh, because it is important to get their temperature down. <clears throat> if you have a fan or an air conditioner of some sort to get some cool air blowing over the dog, it's very important for reducing the temperature. Ice packs can be used and they need to be placed on the large vessel areas like the jugular, the brachial and femoral. Uh, so you might wanna put one, you know, an ice pack around their neck and then put one like between their back legs uh, to help cool down the blood. <clears throat> and you should seek vet veterinarian help as soon as possible you have less than 90 minutes to get a dog to emergency care for heat stroke. <clears throat> and in conclusion, um, we need to just be prepared for high heat, especially unexpected heat waves. Uh, for me, Last year, we went a long time without rain. 
So in a lot of my pastures, the only water I had was a water trough. Um, but at the same time, if the animals, you know, the sheep and the goats are traveling a mile or more, you know, away from a water trough, you know, the sheep and goats, they don't mind, you know, laying down underneath a shade tree a mile away from their water trough and waiting till later in the afternoon till it cools off to come back. In the meantime, though, the dog is getting hot out there. But anyway, so we need to make sure there is sufficient water in pastures for the dogs to cool them themselves. Fans, if necessary, to cool your dogs if they're in small pens or uh, barns. Phys uh, physical fitness is vital for tolerating high heat. And two, we need to know when our animals are not physically fit enough to handle high heat, long distances, you know, like puppies and older dogs. We need to understand and, you know, recognize their limitations. <clears throat> um, you can't have too much water when it comes to hot weather. Um, and this is a, you know, last year, this pond here, it was completely dry. Um, this is one of my young females. She's out in a field. She's, her sheep are out in a big coastal field. Anyway, there's, there's one group of, one group of shade trees that they get under during the middle of the day. And this is her primary way for cooling off is getting into this pond. <clears throat> Prepare for litters in cooler months so that the dam and pups don't suffer from heat stress and try and put older dogs in small pastures and help to help them cope with the hot weather. And we just need to be aware of the warning signs for heat stress in order to help the dogs get cool as soon as possible. Uh, and hopefully we you know, are managing the water and shade and such as that for our dogs that they they don't get into that situation. <clears throat> have a plan for cooling your dog fast. Have an, just an idea in your head. If my dog was overheating, what would I do? And kind of go through that in your mind. And again, discuss with your vet about emergency treatment. Your local veterinarian may not be equipped to deal with treating heat stroke. Um, you know, I, I haven't discussed it with my vet, but when I was wanting emergency help with this dog, because I thought she was delayed in birthing her puppies back in July, I was told that I was going to have to go to Colleen, which is an hour away from me. Uh, so be prepared and have kind of a game plan of what to do with your dogs, you know, if they are needing uh, immediate help. Okay. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? Do any of y'all have anything to share so far as what y'all do to help mitigate the heat for your dogs? Well, on us, it's uh, primarily the little kitty pools that yeah. we buy. They're, they're 20 bucks each, they're expendable. So if they do chew the edges for whatever reason, I mean, it, it's not a big deal, but uh, we put like an inch or two inches of water in it and change it out maybe once or twice a day. And it keeps them out of the water trough, which keeps that water a lot cleaner. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I have, when I have pups and bonding pens, I have to wind up dumping that water out probably multiple times during the day. So they have clean water because they all go and soak in it. Okay, Lachelle, shade up on the hill where there's a breeze, troughs, hose with sprayer on the end. Um, what is this? Found that hosing down the horse with cool water and keep cooling it with water would pull heat out of the animal's body. Screen it down the body temperature. Um, hmm. Yeah, uh, checking a dog's temperature. In all those cases, it's an uh, you're using an anal thermometer to check their temperature. 
Are there guidelines on respiration rates? Because like in humans, you're going to have the easiest way to tell if a person's having a problem is check their pulse, check their respiration rates, just some really basic things. Yeah. Um, the paper I mentioned uh, in one of the first slides, uh, da, 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 da. hyperthermia and heat stroke in the working canine, she goes through on like one of the last pages, she goes through heart rate, respiration rates, okay. body temperatures, a, bu a bunch of stuff that you would have to be, a, I mean, vets figure that out through doing blood tests. I mean, they're doing sure. blood tests on these dogs also. Um, so, but anyway, that, that paper tells respiration rates. If you would want to look that up and read it. Yeah, honestly, you know, my dogs, it's been a lot of years since I've had one out on the farm full time because uh, when my last dog hit about 12, she did have a cardiac problem mm -hmm. and the vet said she just can't be out in the heat anymore. And it was, right. they just noticed uneven pulses in her extremities. Oh, okay. But given, I think she was 12, 13, 14. I mean, she was so old already yeah. that, you know, it was kind of like, well, it's just time for her to come home with me. Um, but up to that point, we just always use the kitty pools um have water troughs out and i mean my dogs have been out in 118 degree weather and been fine but they have shade yeah. they've got kitty pools yeah and i i mean i see them pant hard and i see them but they never get where they won't come when called or have vomited or anything like that i've never had them get like that they just pant yeah well i would imagine if you know, if we did do like a, you know, I say a study of the body temperature of an Akbosh dog, I would, I bet we would see that they under working normal working conditions, they would have a higher body temperature than most dogs and it's perfectly safe. Um, you know, they're a lot hardier than most dogs because yeah. mine, I mean, in my experience, just mine got valley fever, which is something that we have here. Mm -hmm. And it's just a normal part of our ecosystem, but it's a fungus that can get in the lungs. And she got it. And the antifungal drugs are very hard on their liver and kidneys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's like 14 years old at that point. And I was like, okay, we're not going to make dog miserable any longer. Let's just stop mm -hmm. and see what happens. And she totally kicked it by herself once we took away the drugs. So they, I mean, my vet was repeatedly kind of astonished by my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I just feel like they're very hardy dogs and the key probably to like our dogs not being heat stressed in 118 degree weather is that they're in it all the time. Yeah. It's not a surprise or shock. Yeah. Yeah. Your dogs are acclimated to those temperatures and, you know, physical conditions. And for most dogs, it is the unexpected heat wave and too much humidity um, that causes them to suffer from heat stroke. Mm -hmm because they're not prepared for it. Yeah, we can't let our dogs, somebody just said in the comments that a deadly algae grows. Yeah, we have yeah. like these bacteria in our ponds here that you just can't let a dog get in a pond. Yeah, um, I haven't had that problem here. Um, I mean, even when some of our ponds get pretty low, I mean, they don't look real great, but the dogs, you know, if they're not too stressed or something, they'll head to a water trough instead. Yeah. Uh, but I know that, even around the lakes, like in the Austin area last year, they were sending out warnings all the time. Don't let your dog go to the lake and drink water because the algae in the lake was killing dogs. It actually oh, yeah. killed you. Um, but I mean, for the most part, my ponds are fairly safe uh, for my dogs to get in. Well, here, I think it's when the water temps get like in the 90s. Mm -hmm. overnight even because we don't cool off at night and so the water temperature is really warm and it's just yeah. nasty yeah. and you'd be I mean it doesn't even look good it doesn't smell good you you aren't tempted <laughs> <laughs> uh so Lori where you live at it's quite hot and humid um what do you do to help mitigate the heat for your dogs well, I mean, we've got a lot of low lands that hold water. And mm -hmm. of course, all the dogs know where those places are at, which 
bad part is most of them are dried up right now. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't have much right now as far as pond wise, but uh, I know my dogs are like really understaffed right now. So they work most of the night and all my dogs have pits down at the creeks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So where the ground's a little bit cooler and that is where my dogs are staying during the day. I mean, I will see them out to go check on the goats and stuff, but they're not really yeah. traveling them like I should, but I mean, they have to rest and yeah. I realize that my dogs have to rest. I do want to say though, I have experienced some heat problems with bird dogs. And I okay. want to tell you, that, you know, over, can y'all hear me? Yeah. That over, yes. Yeah. That over the years, when you start seeing that big swollen tongue, um, all that blood rushes to that tongue to try to cool that body when they drink that water. And when you start seeing that big swollen tongue, that dog, that is the first sign. That dog's getting oh, okay. God made him that way because that dog's yeah. going to drink water. And when he cools his tongue, he cools his whole body. Okay. And, you know, bird dogs, they're like wide open. Them oh, dogs, yeah. They, they stop. <laughs> They'll literally kill themselves. <laughs> yeah, they will. Yeah, they will. But, you know, when you see that big swollen tongue, you know that, you know, the dog's just too hot. So, okay, that's interesting. Okay, does anyone else have anything else to add to this or suggestions or anything? Well, I usually add ice too. If I come back from my store and I have like extra ice in, I put that like in the um, water troughs as well, especially with oh, okay. the, and my dogs like to burrow tunnel. I mean, they, I have big, huge um, <laughs> holes and pits yeah. and stuff in my yard. Yeah. I've well. got but pits. Any extra <laughs> ice that goes out there in their water troughs too, because. And trying to keep the troughs in the shade. If you yeah. can keep them in the shade during the high part of it, that also keeps the algae down in the trough itself. Because not all the algae is bad. Is there's a certain type of algae that's bad yeah. in the dogs that kills them? I mean, I think it's the brown algae, but I'm not an algae expert. So <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, keeping that having water in the shade for the dogs and that keeping that water cooler um, is is really important. It makes the water better for them and. Yep. Um, less likely to have the algae in it. Um, I know that this year we've, we've, it's been an unusually cool summer for us, actually. I mean, we've, I know there's been several days where we were well over a hundred, but normally it's well over a hundred for weeks on end. Um, so we've actually had cooler weather. I know the dogs have probably been enjoying it a good bit. Um, but anyway, okay, uh, Charlie or who else do we have here? Thad, is there anything uh, that y'all would like to contribute as far as helping to manage uh, heat with your dogs? Just the comments about shade and, and water trough. Oh, okay. Um, this is Charlie. I'm glad she mentioned the bowl tongue, B-O-W-L tongue, because that is a sign. That's what I was going to comment about. It's something we watch for in the working border collies as well. The okay. tongue not only gets elongated, but it gets really big and wide at the bottom. Um, as far as managing the working dogs, um, we keep a drip on several of the water troughs that are in fields where I don't have a pond, um, or I will purposely run over a water trough just to give them a wet spot. And they get in it, they love it. And um, uh, I have a garden that's close to a pasture fence border and I'll run a um, soaker hose up there and it kind of ooks out into the field and they get into that but we're blessed in that most of our fields have some type of water reservoir and a pond or a big puddle or something and they do get in all of that when those dry up and uh, we have to be diligent 
to keep a wet spot for them. Um, we have some terrain on our land and um, some tree cover, which is great. And they find a spot, they get up there where they can see over everywhere, but yet they're up under some cover and, you know, they're working, but they're up there where it's cool. Okay, good deal. <clears throat> yeah, I remember it's probably been over 20 years ago. I remember the Livestock Weekly, um, an agricultural publication that's here in Texas. Um, they had, it was a series of articles on uh, your border collies, herding dogs primarily, and uh, keeping them cool and managing, you know, how to work them and not just kill your dog with the heat. Um, I'm guessing that at the time there was, you know, it was extraordinarily hot and probably people were losing their border collies to overworking them in the heat. Um, but anyway, yeah, with the border collies, it's, it's like the bird dogs, they'll go full out, you know, till they drop. Um, One of the things that mine does, um, this dog, is she will dig like just a little bit, like an inch down until the dirt's wet. And then she'll plant her chest and stomach on that mm -hmm. freshly exposed dirt. And I think that that helps her out. Um, she does that when she's goofing off outside. When yeah. It's hot. If they can lay their, their belly and then that, that skin that has less hair on it, if it can get to a cool area, they can, they can heat, cool themselves better that away. So yeah, that's what she's, she's doing. She's trying to get that skin mm -hmm. close to the cool dirt. Yeah. We were watching her the other day laughing about it because she was just <laughs> being crazy. She's still a baby. And so she was running, chasing and running circles around some large uh, Australian shepherd dogs and just jumping over and going under and foot biting. She wasn't being mean, she was just playing. But yeah. then she would go scoot the grass, clear the grass from the area, dig about an inch down and plant herself to cool yeah. off and then she'd go back at them again. <laughs> they were about done with her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, does anyone else have anything else to add? I'm glad everybody came and participated. Uh, I think it's really been a good program. I'm glad everybody participated like they did. Um, but anyway, I guess if no one else has anything else to say or whatever, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, call an end to the, to the program. I am going to share this on our Facebook uh, page. Okay, Lachelle Curran is asking, where do you check for the pulse? Does anybody, <laughs> where do you check for the pulse on a dog? Like I think stuff. I've gone here. Cause my old dog, I would medic her pretty good just cause she was, I mean, I lost her at 16 and we gone through that valley fever and a bunch of stuff, but primarily with the dogs, I would look at her rate of respiration the most mm -hmm. to see whether she was struggling or not. Um, and then, yeah, I think if I checked, I checked here. I'm just trying to remember back. I can answer that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a licensed veterinary technician in the state of Texas. I'm not a veterinarian, but an, I am an LVT, which is kind of like an RN. The easiest place to, and most accurate place to check for pulse is actually on the thorax and watch. You can see the heart beating at the thorax. Someone mentioned earlier about checking for pulse deficits inside the rear legs. You do that in conjunction with the pulse on the thorax. So you want them to match. Right. So when you see a veterinarian checking pulses on the inside, hind leg, they are also at the same time checking the actual heart rate at the thorax. And they're looking for a pulse deficit, uh, which can be indicative of a whole lot of stuff. But so it's a blocked artery, isn't it? Or like narrowed arteries? It can be a number of things. But, the, but to actually just check a basic 
pulse rate on a dog, the best place is to visualize or put your hand on and palpate the thorax, the heart, the left side of the chest. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that, Charlie. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a human. I used to do midwifery. And so I'm always trying to go, how do I do that to my dog? <laughs> <laughs> good question, Lachelle. Okay, does anyone else have anything else to add or? Okay, well, it's been a great session. Thank you everybody for participating and listening. Uh, I am gonna have this, share this on our Facebook page. Um, but anyway, hopefully I'll have that.